Hello, everybody, and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's continuing Bible studies into the book of 1 Samuel, heard at this very same time, Monday through Friday. And we thank you for being with us wherever you are and however you're listening to us, either through eBible Fellowship's webcast audio or through Skype or perhaps through Pal Talk or even over the phone. And we pray that the Lord's blessings will be with us over the next 30 minutes or so as we now prepare to open our Bibles and introduce. Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Welcome, everyone, to our study in the book of 1 Samuel. This is our eighth study, and tonight we're going to read from verses 11 through 15. And she vowed a vow and said, O Jehovah of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto Jehovah all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before Jehovah, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken, And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before Jehovah. I'll I'll read verse 16 also. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. And we um, were looking at verse 11, and we saw that Hannah had taken a vow. She vowed a vow. And the vow involved um, a son. If God would hear her prayer and grant her request, she would turn then and give that child, that boy, to the Lord, that is to the service of the Lord, all the days of his life. And it, it, it helps us when we see the uh, last part of verse 11. And there shall no razor come upon his head. Now we're, we're given a little bit more detail Uh, concerning the type of vow that Hannah took. And the vow that she took was a Nazarite vow. We, We read about the vow of the Nazarites in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 6. And it says, um, well, really, it's, it's verses 1 through 21 that, um, that discuss the Nazarite vow. I'll just read uh, several of the verses beginning in, in verse 1. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto Jehovah, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor Come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto Jehovah. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto Jehovah, he shall come at no dead body. And and uh, the chapter continues. Uh, God gives more information concerning the particulars of a Nazarite vow. Now, one thing that stands out as we read Numbers chapter 6 and 
and uh, learn about the Nazarite vow is that the one who takes this vow of the Nazarite is to be separate. He is separated from the rest of uh, his brethren, from the rest of the children of Israel, or or from all that have not taken a Nazarite vow. The word separate or separation appears 15 times in Numbers chapter 6. And it's the same word or, or related word in 14 of the 15 times, just once in verse 2. It, is it a different word um, than the rest? Uh, and, and there's also another word that that is in number six that is the same hebrew word and it's consecrate or consecration they're the same hebrew words as separator separation and and consecrate or consecration is found three times so 18 times in 21 verses god uses the word or the idea that the individual who takes the Nazarite vow is to be separate. He is to be consecrated unto the Lord. And, and, and then God says, or this is the manner in which he will be separate. And that uh, just, just really um, uh, emphasizes the, the tremendous setting apart the one with an, uh, of the one who has taken a Nazarite vow from everyone else. And I think we can see as Samuel, uh, or the, the son who will be born to Hannah, um, is set apart uh, for the service of God in the sanctuary. He, he will, uh, from a child, serve God uh, with Eli and then even after Eli passes away, uh, Samuel will continue as a judge of Israel. He will continue until his death in serving God as a prophet uh, in the land of Israel. So he was he was separated unto this work, and and that's uh, in fulfillment of Hannah's vow. I will give him unto Jehovah. All the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And that's ex- exactly what happened with Samuel. Uh, he he was someone uh, from his mother's womb. Uh, actually, this vow was taken before he was even born. And again, this reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ, who also was under a vow I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of Jehovah. And that vow was uh, taken by God himself that he would fulfill it. He would provide salvation for his people before Christ was born. And then when Jesus was born, all the days of his life, he was set apart, separate. Um, from sinners, separate, yet he lived amongst us. He entered into the human race and 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 took upon himself a human body and a human nature. And, and uh, yet all the days of his life, he served God singularly. He served God perfectly uh, as a Nazarite. In a sense, we could say, as someone who had a vow upon him, and and uh, Samuel or the son that will be born to Hannah is is representing this. Now we also um, are reminded of another individual when we think of the uh, the vow of a Nazarite, and as soon as we we read in Numbers that a razor is not to come upon the the one who takes this vow, we immediately think of another judge besides Samuel. We think of Samson. And if we 
go back, um, the previous book was Ruth, and before that was Judges. If we go back to Judges 13, we'll find that uh, Manoah was Samson's father, and he had a wife, and she she's unnamed in Judges 13. But they had an, account, an encounter with the angel of the Lord, or the angel of Jehovah, God himself. And it says in verse 2, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. Now once again, that uh, that is very similar to Hannah. Hannah was barren and could not have a child. And the angel of Jehovah appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. This is similar in in several details to Hannah and what we're reading in 1 Samuel, that um, she uh, both women were barren, and uh, in this case, God is coming to her and and uh, says she will conceive and bear a son. And that also reminds us of Mary in the New Testament. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, not accidental that we read of so many faithful women in the Bible that were barren. They, they could not have a child. And this is done in order to portray and to picture the barrenness of the the bride of of Christ or uh, or the body of believers throughout eleven thousand years of history, from uh, the the days of Adam and Eve. Remember, the promise was given: "I will set enmity between thy seed and the um, and the seed of the serpent." And and again, thy seed, uh, as as God promised to Abraham, that his seed uh, would would uh, bring about tremendous blessing, and that seed was Christ. And so too in Genesis three, when the promise was given, the the seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, and and uh, early on after man's fall into sin. God gave the promise of the Messiah, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the human race, and men waited. God's people waited on the Lord patiently, expectantly, looking for and searching diligently, we read in 1 Peter. Um, let, let's take a look at that in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says in verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So the prophets who prophesied of old. They searched diligently, and and they were asking questions concerning the time. How long, O oh Lord? It, it, it uh, certainly was asked by God's people for um, the period of the Old Testament as generation came and generation went. And no sign, no indicator um, of any um, fulfillment 
of the coming Messiah. Well, of course, signs were given, but they were a long way off. And for thousands of years, thousands of years, the the Lord Jesus Christ did not come into the world. You know, we we're waiting now for his second coming, and yet we have not yet waited two thousand years. To uh, a full two thousand years would be in twenty thirty three A.D. We're only in twenty twelve. And and we, of course, we feel like we've waited so long, and and it, and from our perspective, we have, I suppose, but nothing in comparison to the saints of old, to the to the old time people of God who lived prior to the cross, and they looked just as longingly as we look before the Messiah. And and yet uh, he did not come a generation after generation. And therefore, it was as though the woman, the body of believers, was barren. Uh, just she could not conceive. She could not bring forth. Oh, but but she did. And and so God uh, does cause Sarah to give birth to Isaac. And God does cause Rachel to give birth to Joseph. And God does cause Hannah eventually to give birth to Samuel. And and uh, God does bring these barren women a, a son. And, and the Lord says in the book of Genesis with Isaac, who was born to Abraham and Sarah, that uh, it, it, in the proper season, he he came. In the proper uh, time, he was born according to the promise. And and this um, we can we can find um, elements of God teaching this as we read about all these barren women of the Old Testament. Uh, at, at least in many cases, we can see the spiritual picture. Okay, going back to First Samuel. In verse 12 and 13. Now, and it came to pass, as she continued praying before Jehovah, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. Now, Eli, remember, was seated by a post of the temple. And Hannah uh, went to the temple somewhere uh, visible to Eli. He could see her location, and he was watching her. And uh, we we don't know how many people were there. Maybe at this particular time, only Hannah. Maybe there were a few others. But for whatever reason... Eli begins to focus in on Hannah, this this um, uh, woman who who is there, and Hannah is is seemingly speaking, but she's not saying anything. Maybe Eli was close enough to her in order that he could hear if she had said something. But he didn't hear anything. He saw her lips moving. And and he's marking her mouth. He's watching her very closely and very intently. But God tells us that Hannah was speaking, but she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved. And uh, I know uh, I've done that uh, at times. I'm sure you have too, and pretty much all all people have at some point if you're praying and and uh, especially if you do not want anyone to hear you uh but but for some reason it it's like you want to say the words and so you mouth the the things that you're saying to God and and the child of God knows that God hears the thoughts of the heart and 
And so it doesn't matter if we actually speak the words outwardly, verbally. It, God can hear if we do that, yes, but he also hears if we speak inwardly, in our heart, in our soul. And we don't even have to move our lips, but just on occasion um, we might. And maybe it was Hannah's habit to do this. It, that doesn't matter. But she's she's praying, and Eli, watching her lips move, but hearing no sound, uh, he he makes an assumption, and he it, it's a wrong assumption, but he uh, believes that she is drunken, and he believes this to the point that he says unto her in verse fourteen, "How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away." thy wine from thee. So Eli watches Hannah, and it strikes him strangely, and then he assumes she's been drinking, and and he makes the statement, uh, how long will you be drunken? Put away your wine. Obviously to him, she has been drinking. And, and, and we wonder... Um, hasn't Eli ever prayed like this? Hasn't Eli ever um, uh, talked to God in his heart and and mouthed words to God? How could he not recognize that? Being a high priest of Israel, being the sitting in the seat of authority of Israel, how could he fail to see that this woman was distraught? And was in prayer, and 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 mistake it, and misunderstand what she was doing, to the point that he would think she was drunken. She wasn't um, acting drunkenly, uh, as she wasn't staggering around. Uh, she wasn't. Um, she she wasn't saying all kinds of crazy things. She was quietly unassumingly speaking to god she was at the temple after all she wasn't at a bar and yet eli just completely misinterprets the whole thing and he he believes that she has been drinking and he even tells her to put away her wine what what a um a misunderstanding and and why is this? Why is God even telling us this? Well, let, let's look at the word moved. Um, Hannah, it says in verse th- 13, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. And the word moved is also found in Isaiah 29. In verse 9, Stay yourselves in wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. The word stagger is the word move um, that that refers to Hannah's lips. It's also translated as stagger in Psalm 107 and verse 27. Uh, I'll begin in verse 26, speaking of men on ships. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. So again, this word stagger that that um, um, Hannah's mouth, her, her lips, Move. They staggered. She perhaps they were quivering. Uh, they were they were moving with emotion, and sometimes people's lips quiver, and and this uh, is um, what Eli witnessed. But it's interesting that that word God uses in a couple of other places in relationship to drunkenness, and and so we. We also see that Eli thought she had been drunken. Now, the word drunken um, is in Proverbs 
26, 9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Now here, uh, God is uh, making a relationship. He's tying these two thoughts together. Uh, as a thorn goes up into the hand of a drunkard. And an individual who has had too much to drink may injure himself or herself. He, he could fall into a thorn bush. Uh, and, and normally, if he were sober, uh, he he would yelp and and uh, his hand would begin to ache because he has this big thorn stuck in it and it's bleeding and 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 he would take care of it right away but not someone who's been drinking too much not someone who has uh really deadened their feelings and and now uh, they they can't notice ordinary things. They don't feel um, the these kinds of things. And so the thorn went up into his hand and as the man fell into the bush, but he gets up and he laughs it off and he continues on his way and he doesn't know. He's ignorant that a thorn has stuck into his hand, that blood is dripping from his hand. And he, he goes on his merry way. And God says that is like um, a parable in the mouth of fools. That is the word of God, as the whole Bible really is written as a parable, in the mouth of the unsaved. Remember the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were foolish. It uh, The definition for a fool is someone without wisdom and christ is wisdom so an individual without christ is a fool and they have the parable the the bible in their mouth they have the bible in their hands they possess it and they do not know what they have they're ignorant of the teaching of the bible to a large degree. And and so uh, God uh, relates this to drunkenness. Now, also in Isaiah, in chapter 28, we read of um, drunkards in verses 1 and 3. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys, of them that are overcome with wine. And then verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under feet. So in this context, we, we then begin to read in verse 7, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Jesus, John fourteen six tells us is the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Now here uh, we, we find God giving us more information about drunkenness. And he is relating it to those that make mistakes, grave mistakes. They err when it comes to the truths of the Bible, and they go out of the way, the way of salvation, the way of Christ, in doctrine and in gospel, and and it's a grievous thing. So spiritually, we, we have a situation where Eli is looking at Hannah, who represents the believer's and he is making the mistake of thinking that Hannah is like a drunkard, that that she um, spiritually is out of the way. Well, we'll have to look more at this in our next study. 
uh, thank you for being with us. And Lord willing, uh, we'll pick this up again tomorrow evening. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Chris McCann with his continuing studies into the book of 1 Samuel. These studies are heard every Monday through Friday night at this very same time over Pal Talk, over Skype, over eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over the phone. Lord willing, we'll have another Bible study for you tomorrow night into the book of 1 Samuel. And until then, may the Lord's perfect will be done. Good night.